Thank you for joining us for week 10 of Community Christian Church's study of the book of Revelation. Last week, uh, week nine, we spent some time talking about the concept of the rapture, and now we're ready to get back to the actual text of Revelation. Uh, previously, we had looked at chapter four in which letters are written to seven church churches. Uh, those letters have been written. Uh, the Christians of Asia Minor received personal correspondence from the risen and glorified Lord of the church. And while they contain some correction and commendation, mixed to varying degrees, depending on the church that received the letter, the challenge to all of them is to overcome because they are about to enter a period of intensified conflict. Thus, we come to chapter seven, and it's the second vision that John receives. The first vision started in chapter one and went all the way through chapter three. And now in chapter four, we have uh, the second vision. So I'm gonna read all of chapter four, and then we'll go back and go over it verse by verse. So let me read chapter four of Revelation uh, from the New International Version of the Bible. After this, I looked and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I'd first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the spirit and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Ruby, a rainbow that shone like an emerald encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings and peals of thunder. In front of the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Also in front of the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass clear as crystal. In the center around the throne were four living creatures and they were covered with eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like an ox and the third had a face like a man. The fourth was like a flying eagle. But each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. Day and night, they never stop saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they were created and have their being. Okay, let's go back then now to chapter one, I mean, chapter four, verse one and go through it bit by bit. The first thing we see is John sees a door standing open in heaven. And the word heaven is used in different ways by John in the book of Revelation, and he means different things by it at different places. Sometimes it's a reference to God's eternal dwelling place. But it can also be a heaven which will eventually be destroyed in Revelation 21, and even a place of conflict in Revelation 12. And then again, the word can actually just mean the sky. We need to remember that John is having a vision. So when he sees this, it's something like a metaphor explaining to him something that is about to happen to him. It's basically a way of saying that John is gonna get into and see things from God's heavenly perspective. The point is not so much that John is gonna to travel to a different place, but he's gonna be taken into God's throne room through which he can see that everything that's going on from behind the scenes and understand what's gonna take place and how it all fits together. The voice which in chapter one commanded John to write now bids him to come to the door of heaven. That's Christ, Christ inviting John. And it's interesting because in Revelation one, we see an awesome description of Christ standing there. But when we get later on, we're gonna see Christ as the lamb and, and John's gonna see the lamb in the throne room. And we shouldn't get hung up by this because all of these are basically symbolic representations of Christ that are there to give us understanding and insight. We don't need to spend time trying to say, well, how can Christ be this one vision that there's something with a fire coming out of his mouth and later on be a lamb? He, he's not one or other in a sense of actual physical presence, but he's represented by these things so we can have understanding. We need to kind of have a symbolic imagination as we look at these things. John is about to see what must take place after this. And that definitely assigns a lot of the content that we're gonna to get to later as something that happens in the future. 
Now, it's not entirely all the future. There will be some sections that will look back to the past and some sections that describe what is already present. But there's going to be a lot of the future events described here. And that's why back in Revelation 1.19, Christ commanded John to write what will take place later. And now he's going to show him these things that will take place later so he can write them down. Now, events on earth have their origin in heaven. So the heavenly ascent here is not something that we should not expect if John is going to get insight from God's perspective into all of history. He gets to see all things from the vantage point of the heavenly throne room. Now, verse 2, John makes it clear that he did this in the spirit. At once I was in the spirit. He entered into a trance. Now, this may be a little bit difficult because John already entered a trance back in chapter 1, verse 10, when he beheld the vision of the glorified Christ. And there's no place where it really says he went back to his normal senses. But at once I was in the spirit kind of conveys the idea that he was out of it for a while. We really don't know if John received all these visions one right after another on a day or if it happened over a period of days. Uh, maybe we don't need to worry about that. The main thing here is that John was in an exalted state. And it was possible being in this exalted state to see things from heaven. The visions that he's going about to see are something that he's not seeing so much with his physical eyes. And he didn't really need to travel a physical distance to see these. It's more like he's stepping into another reality, into the spiritual reality, as opposed to the physical reality. And in the physical world, he can see things because God makes it clear to him. Now, those that believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, those who have a dispensationalist premillennial theology, interpret this language to be a reference to the rapture of the church. They believe that John represents all Christians. The trumpet voice is actually the trumpet call, and John going to the throne room stands for the rapture of Christians of all ages. According to this view, the time of the Great Tribulation, when God's people are persecuted by the Antichrist, has nothing to do with the church, so the church has to be removed. It's the time of Jacob's trouble. That is when the Jewish people will once again be the center of God's dealings in the last days. We've talked about this before, and, and last week I gave the reasons why I don't think this view is accurate, but let me just simply make the point here that to think that, you have to assume it. You have to, to just bring that understanding to the passage, because there are no specific explicit statements in this passage or in the New Testament that describe and say that is what's going to happen. There's no reference to the church being raptured in Revelation 4.1. The language addressed exclusively to John and refers only to his going there to receive the visions of the future that he's going to see. He is in the spirit, not in the body. Well, when John gets into to heaven, first thing he sees is a throne. The throne as a symbol occurs more than 40 times in Revelation. In fact, that is three out of every four times it occurs in the New Testament. And it's there to symbolize the absolute sovereignty of God, his absolute rule. He is the supreme power. He is the supreme authority. Now we get to verse three, John begins to give a vision uh, of what is, happens, what he sees there on the throne. God, uh, John has been granted a vision of God seated on his throne. And, and when he does this, we need to, to think about what's going on here. Because sometimes scripture speaks of God making the entire heavens his throne. In fact, Solomon realized that heavens could not really even hold God, contain God, because he's bigger than the heavens. So John is careful here not to depict the one seated on the throne in any kind of human form. He doesn't describe him with human characteristics. Rather, what he focuses on is the brilliance of light reflected by precious stones. That's a common pattern when God is described in heaven. It's, it's lights. The psalmist spoke of God as one who covers himself in light as a garment. And Paul described the dwelling as inapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. The source, basically, of this throne room vision of John's is actually Ezekiel chapter 1. And when, once again, the throne appears like sapphire surrounded by a rainbow. The identification of the three stones that the NIV translates as jasper, ruby, and emerald is somewhat uncertain. You see, ancients didn't have those scientific terminology to describe the different precious stones or the precious stones. So we're not always sure exactly what they meant, and it can be somewhat uh, uncertain what they meant. So what we can see here sometimes is that scholars will say, well, I think this is what the stone is, and it could mean this or it could mean this. And there's a lot of speculation about that, and it might be worthwhile. But in the end, I don't think the stones were so much supposed to communicate a specific concept as much as, as conveyed the brilliance and the beauty and the majesty of God. 
That's why all there's this focus on light and brightness and glory. It's trying to spy God as one who is resplendent and beautiful and majestic. Let's push on now to, to, uh, to verse four. Here's what it talks about there. It says, you've got this throne with brilliance light coming from it. And around the throne are 24 other thrones. And these thrones are occupied by 24 elders who are dressed in white and wearing crowns. Throughout the book, they are pictured as falling down before God in worship. Twice, one of their number acts as a spokesman or interpreter. And on one occasion, they join the four living creatures in presenting the prayers of the saints. Adoration and praise are continually on their lips. Well, who are the elders? Well, there are at least 13 different views according to one commentator. I think it basically breaks down that there are two views that have some weight. One is they're angelic beings. The other is they are a representation of the church, of God's people. Now, why we might think it's the church is because the number 24, and it's said to represent the 12 patriarchs or the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles, 12 and 12, 24, the Old and the New Testament. And so it's kind of viewed as an idealized picture of the church, of the God's people uh, as a result of the resurrection of Christ and his ascension to heaven. In fact, Ephesians 2, 6 says, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Of course, this view is held by those who believe in a rapture of the church, which they think took place at the start of chapter four. And this view had some support um, in the King James translation of the Bible. Uh, when the King James translates Revelation chapter five, nine, it has those who are sitting on the throne singing this song. Let me read it to you from the King James version. And they sung a new song saying, thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. So if the us there is, uh, is the church, it makes sense because those are redeemed. Angels aren't redeemed. And so the, uh, support for the view that this represents the church is found in the King James translation of Revelation 5, 9. However, there's a problem there because the Greek text of the, uh, the, the translators of the King James use is not the most reliable translation, not the most reliable text of the Greek New Testament. Copies were made and copies were copied. And, and the copies of the Greek text that, that the uh, King James would translate from is generally thought to be somewhat defective. Uh, some things were added to kind of bring about clarification of meaning that actually weren't there in the original text. And when you add something in hopes that it clarifies, it may also unclarify, make it more confusing or, or make it say something that it doesn't. So modern scholars say that the text is really a little bit different. It should be more translated like the, the NIV translates it in Revelation 5, 9. And, and let me read that for you now. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and with your blood, you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You see, the word us is actually not in the Greek text and, and really neither is the word persons. It's simply blank there. With your blood, you purchase for God from every tribe and language and people. So actually the elders are not including themselves in the redeemed. In fact, they are singing about the redeemed as if they are a separate group. And then again, in Acts 14.3, the elders are set over against those who were purchased out of the earth, who sing a new song, which the elders can't learn. So if those purchased sing a new song and the elders can't sing it, then obviously the elders are not those who were purchased, who were saved. They are not the church. They are something different than the church. So that makes us think that perhaps the church is not being represented by that and that the 12 elders are something else. And what is that? Well, I think a better understanding is that they are angelic beings. And there's no difficulty in understanding the 12 elders as being a body of angels who execute divine rule in the universe. Being clothed in white is the typical garb of angels when we see them in the Bible. And Paul refers to angels as a group having their ranks. There's ranks of angels, there's thrones, there's principalities, there's rulers in the unseen world. In the Old Testament, God is sometimes described as being surrounded by a council of heavenly beings. Psalm 89, seven said, God is feared in the council of the holy ones, great and terrible above all that are about him. So there's a reference there to somebody being around about God, some holy ones. And it's not a reference to Christians or the saints because they've not been resurrected yet. Jesus has not come and, and has not taken people back to heaven to be with him. God will reign on Mount Zion, says Isaiah 24. Before his elders, he will manifest his glory. 
And then Micah says, the Lord seated on his throne and all the host of heavenly and heaven standing beside him on his right hand and on his left. So there's lots of descriptions in the Old Testament of God being surrounded by beings, by heavenly beings. So we can conclude that the 24 elders are a company of angels who serve as some kind of heavenly counterpart to, to leaders on the earth. They are the ones that are pictured as executing God's divine rule. They worship God because he is about to bring history to its goal, uh, judge the dead, reward the servants and the prophets and the saints. The 24 elders may, in fact, refer or have a reference to the 24 orders of priests in the Old Testament. You know, these things are not really clear. However, what we see is they don't serve a priestly function in heaven. Their function is basically to praise God, both for creation, which we're going to see in chapter four, and redemption that we see in chapter four. The number 24 is actually not used again in Revelation in any connection, although references are made to the elders. Now, the interpretation is also supported by a vision received in John uh, in Revelation chapter 7, uh, verses 9 through 11. And there it's, it's a picture of this heavenly throne room, and it kind of describes those gathered around him in circles, concentric circles. In the outer circle, we have, uh, have people, have the saved, and then there's a circle that has angels. And then there's a circle that has the 24, and then there's a circle that has the four living creatures, and then there is the throne. And so if you've got the church on the farthest outside circle, it would mean that the church is not represented by that 24 in the inner circle, that there's a clear distinction, there's a clear order of things. The elders are grouped with the angelic beings, not with the earthly beings, the ones that are resurrected. Let's move on. Verse four, from the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings and peals of thunder. In front of the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. The majesty and glory of the divine presence are enhanced by flashes of lightning, by voices and peals of thunders. And, and these are common manifestation of the presence of God in the Old Testament. It sub symbolizes his power and his glory. And the presence of the Holy Spirit is represented by the seven torches of fire which burn before the throne. And we met that symbolization, symbolism of seven to note the fullness of the spirit back in Revelation 1.4. Uh, the first division is a little bit awkward because uh, they were added by scholars later on when John wrote Revelation, he didn't go chapter one, verse one. Scholars did that to make it easiest for it to study God's word. Think what it'd be like if we didn't have these divisions. All we had was words after words after words. We would have a hard time getting together and say, let's all go look at this section. If they say something like, look at word 1000 in Revelation, we have to count it through. So we're thankful for the chapter and verse divisions, but we recognize they're not perfect. And so we've got a division here of verse six and the first part kind of goes with this section and the next part goes with the next. So we're gonna look at Revelation 6a first and then 6b separately. He goes on to say, also in front of the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. Here's the language of simile. The sea before the throne was not made of glass, but is something like glass. And again, scholars uh, write books and preachers make all kinds of illustrations to kind of go into detail about what the possible meaning of the sea of glass is. Uh, but basically we are to understand that it is a visual phenomena that adds to the awesome splendor of the throne room. It's, it just kind of makes it look, wow, this is a special place, a crystal surface across the floor, not, not bricks or something like that, and flashes of lightning and, and lightning coming from the throne flect, uh, reflecting all this. This just kind of sets the stage. This is the area in which the, the events around the throne are gonna take place and it's all a majestic place. God again, John again is here speaking of how amazing and transcendent God, how, how unspeakable, wonderful that place is. And the best he can do to describe it is just saying the floor before the throne was like crystal clear and beautiful, stretching on forever and filled with more of that beautiful light that came from the throne. Now, 6b, the second part of that verse, we get, a, get more of a focus back on what's the, there. It says, in the center of the throne were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and in back. So in addition to the 24 elders, in the center, or kind of around the throne, we have four living creatures. And exactly what's meant in the center is uncer uncertain. Maybe it just means in the center of the 24 around there. But they are circling the throne, and it's appropriate because they are to be the, the worship leaders in a sense. They are all seeing, their eyes being toward gods and toward creation. And the four living creatures of John's vision are related to the cherubim of Ezekiel chapter one. 
although there are some important differences. In Ezekiel, each of the four have four faces. That means all four have four faces. They have four wings instead of six wings like they have in Revelation chapter four, verse eight. And the rims of the wheel with which they're associated, not their bodies are full of eyes. In Revelation, the four living creatures might suggest more the seraphim of Isaiah six, chapter two and three, who are constantly lifting up their voices and praise singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord almighty. They also have six wings. Here we have a good example of, God's, of John's freedom to kind of transform images from his sources and bring them together and blend them together to create new images. Now, many scholars see the four living creatures as cherubim, but uh, there's some differences, so that may be unlikely. In Ezekiel chapter 10, they are carrying the throne, and, and these are not carrying the throne, they are around the four. And these, those have all those four faces, while each of these have only one face. Perhaps the seraphim of Isaiah are more likely to be similar to the four living creatures, but we don't really know enough about them. There's not enough of a description of the seraphim, and the scripture doesn't really say for sure they are. The thing we can say is in view of their closeness to the throne, these are the most important of all created beings, four of them. And in some sense, they might say they stand for all of creation. Um, to, to, you know, people will again speculate on what they all mean and, and people can spend some time talking about that, but the, pax, the, pa the passage doesn't really make that clear if what's meant by these. Their closeness to the throne shows that they are important and they constantly praise God, but they are also associated with the outpouring of God's wrath later on in Revelation. Well, here's the description. The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had a face like a man. And the fourth was like a flying eagle. While Ezekiel's cherubim had four faces, lion in the right, ox to the left, man in front, eagle behind, only one of John's sped, said, said to have a face. The other three are in the forms of a lion, an ox, and an eagle. Sweet writes this in his commentary. The four forms suggest whatever is noblest, strongest, wisest, and swiftest in animated nature. Now, however, it doesn't mean that this is basically saying nature is divine. We are dealing with angelic beings that are created by God. Henderson, Hendrickson interprets it as having the strength of a lion, the ability to serve as an ox, the intelligence of a man, and the swift, swiftness of an eagle. Uh, you know, in early days of the church, there was always an attempt to equate the four living creature with the four gospels. John's the lion, Luke is the ox or the calf, Matthew is a man, and Mark an eagle. But there's really nothing in the passage that cause, should cause us to say that. Well, verse 8 this gives another description, a further description of the four living creatures. Again, they have six wings and are covered with eyes. But the focus there is night and day, they never stop saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And again, in some ways like the cherubim and some ways like the seraphim. Second time their eyes are mentioned. That is that all seeing function is very important. And the living ones praise God continually. Again, their song reminds us of Isaiah chapter six and the seraphs are saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The repetition is impressive. It's kind of to build a significant, a significant important. And so is the fact that they are described as being holy. You know, John mentions holy, holy, holy. And that's important because those who read his, his uh, a letter, they lived in an evil world where evil was rampant. And it always seemed like it was very powerful. The evil always seemed so powerful. Goodness seemed weak and frustrated and ineffective. So John sees this first vision of the throne room and wants to communicate to those that would read his letter, what you see is deceptive. You know, God, the, the Roman Empire is not in control. They are not all powerful. Evil will not always win because God is holy. He is separate and he's pure and he's good and he's powerful. Real power is not with evil, but with the God who is holy. What you're experiencing right now on earth is just a passing phase. Let me reveal to you and describe to you the God who is, who was, and is to come. And let me describe him as powerful, eternal, glorious, and holy, and he will triumph over all evil. Let's push on now to the, the last few verses in the chapter. Revelation chapter 9. 
And then so we see that with the angel, when the uh, 24 elders sing, it's what happens. Well, when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 angels, uh, 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. And they lay their crowns before him. And we'll talk about what they say in just a minute. But let's talk a little bit more about what's, what's going on here in, in these verses. Uh, living creatures are going to give glory and honor to God. And whenever they do that, the elders just respond by prostrating themselves before the throne and casting their crowns there and joining and singing to the one who lives forever and ever. Falling down is the proper response when one sees the majesty and awesomeness of God. That's the appropriate behavior because of who he is, his eternal being and majesty. In fact, the word worship it origins from a word which describes as someone prostrating himself or bowing down before a deity or before a king to kiss his feet or the hem of his garment. And that was an act of reverence that was very common in the East at that time. So just saying God is the one you should bow down to, not the emperor, not somebody else. Also, the casting of crowns symbolizes that the elders recognize that whatever authority they have, whatever ruling and power they have represented by the crown they wear, is something that they've been given by God. It's a delegated authority. And so they give him honor by freelingly returning to him the crown that they've been given to indicate it comes from him and that he is worthy of all honor and all power and all authority. And here's what they say. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. The praise of the elders differs a little bit from that of the living creatures. And let me just show you a little bit of difference there. You see, the elders' praise is kind of directed directly to God, and uh, it's, it's basically all about who he is. And then you see the other uh, direction here is more about what he did. So the elders are praising God, holy, holy, holy is the Lord our God Almighty who was and is to come. He's praising, they're praising his character, his being, his nature. Well, you see when the, when, when, um, well, it's, it's, no, I'm sorry, I got, I got it backwards. The four living creatures give the holy praise about God's character and nature and who he is. And then the elders, when they pray, they talk about him being worthy because of what he's done. He's created all things and they were created because of his will. And so there's a little bit of, of difference there in, what, in the nature of their praise. Both are valuable. And in fact, your, our prayer life, when we give God prayers or praise, we should include both uh, praising for who he is and thanking him and praising him for what he's done. And it's rep represented here in Revelation's fourth chapter in what the four living creatures do and the 24 elders. Well, let me go back. I want to go back here to talk about this. It's interesting when you look at what they say, it's kind of a reflection of something that's going on in the world at that time. Because you are worthy is how the emperor would be greeted when he came into Rome on a triumphal procession. Uh, you've seen movies where there's fights, the Roman Empire is in control and power and there's fights and battles and the emperor comes back victorious and as he comes into Rome, there's this great parade and people surrounding the streets cheering him on and behind him are his soldiers and behind him are the, are the booty they've captured and the people have taken prisoner. What the people are saying to him as he comes in is you are worthy, you are worthy, you know, he's worthy of praise and adoration. And Emperor Domitian, who was really big on pushing the cult of emperor worship, wanted to be direct, addressed as Lord and God. But what's happening here is the 24 elders are saying, no, 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 not the emperor, but you, God who sits on the throne, you are worthy of our praise. You are the one who is our Lord and our God. And to say that about anything else is blasphemy. To say that about anything else is usurping who God is and how God should be worshiped and God should be honored. So it's the elders have added to the, what was said earlier, power, you receive glory and honor and power because it was accordance with him that everything what, that exists was existed and came into being. God exists, he brought everything into being and he's working the events of history toward a conclusion that he wants. So John is gonna to begin to unfold the events that he sees and he's gonna write these down so the beleaguered churches that are written to in chapters two and three can be encouraged. He recognizes that those have been persecuted, experience hard times. It's coming from the Roman empire. It's coming from the Jews that surround them. But he wants them to know that there is a superior power, much superior to the throne room of the emperor, much more glorious than the throne room of the emperor with more impressive creatures surrounding it, giving praise. 
No picture is given of God himself as a human being, but, God, but John describes with awesome splendor and majesty what he sees on the throne. It's a picture that should stir our emotions of God's greatness and sovereignty. And the only proper response is to obey and worship God. And, and that's what he's wanting to remind them is yes, you are about to experience some hard times and you're gonna suffer some, but nevertheless, God is the sovereign Lord of the universe. And your suffer, suffering, your difficulties is not the end. This is the end. This is the picture to keep in your mind, a God who's wholly transcendent and wholly powerful. And it's one that's really, comes from John as a Christian Jew and with that knowledge of the Old Testament, he's able to describe things in a way that's consistent with the Old Testament, but adds a New Testament insight. And we're especially gonna get that New Testament insight in chapter five, where we see the lamb who was slain and how he deserves glory and honor and praise as well. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity, but once again, reminded of how awesome you are how powerful, majestic, and holy you are. You're surrounded by creatures that we cannot imagine giving you praise and glory. And Father, you give us the privilege of joining them, that someday we too will be there uh, in your presence, in your throne room, experiencing all these things, these sights, these sounds, hearing these things, seeing these things. We will be in awe. We too will fall down, fall down in worship and give you praise. And it'll be the greatest day of our life. We pray that we'll look forward to this. We'll remain faithful to you, that we will be overcomers so we can join you there. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thanks for joining us. Uh, we're gonna look at chapter five uh, next week. So I encourage you to read that before we do that. Uh, thanks again for joining us. If you wanna see some of the other uh, lessons we taught other weeks, they're all on our church's YouTube page. And you can find that, find a link to that on our website, cccnyc.org. Thanks again for joining us. Goodbye. <laughs>